This is just this is it. This is it. This is it. Phone getting us ready along with the other members of the committee. And I was just so tickled talking to this next speaker uh, the first time on the phone. She had this spirit about her that was infectious. I just got off the phone and went into Stacy's office and said, oh my goodness, she's going to be amazing. I have no idea what she's going to talk about, but it's going to be amazing. Um, and then after hearing her rehearse, I was totally right. So I'm not giving any hints. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Casey Musk. It's a progress of impossible to possible. So every person consciously and subconsciously, they want to learn about how to grow and thrive in life. And the principles that we're going to discuss today, it's not my personal opinion, this is not a religion. This is, and these are, observable truths that you can see in the world. Our life is literally a continuous stream of moving from impossible to possible. Now, you can think of it in this way and make it super mundane. So think about when you started to learn how to drive a car. And you were 15 years old and you're super nervous and you're sweating behind that wheel of that driver's ed car and you're like, I'm never going to be able to take my hand off the wheel. And then like fast forward, like 20, you're 25 years old, you're driving down and you're getting calls from your mother. Well, that's me. I'm getting calls from my mother. Or you're like changing the music or you're looking at your phone and what is the last thing that you're thinking? The same thing that you thought was impossible at one point now has become possible. You are driving. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this, that the things that we want most in life, we have to have the greatest patience for. But, like happiness and joy and all those other things, they still come and they move in this exact progression from impossible to possible. A person commits suicide in the moment that they lose perspective of possible. My sister Maya killed herself November 14th, 2007, and it was the first time that I felt like life was impossible. It was impossible for me to talk to her, to save her, to recover her, to have a conversation and tell her it was going to be okay. Now, Maya was bipolar, and when she came out of my mother's womb, she, my mom would tell you she was nuts. Mrs. Jaffer even knows her. She was like a Tasmanian <laughs> devil who would run around the middle school. But the interesting thing that I thought about before her death is from the age of 18 to 22 for myself, I was the one that was at most risk. So I remember thinking after I graduated Northwestern, I'm thinking in my room, like, what am I going to do with life? And this feels like so overwhelming. So I walked downstairs to my mom and I said, and I couldn't believe that these words were coming out of my mouth, I said, Mom, I think I'm going to kill myself. And she, before I could even say that, I swear to God, my fault, it was like ESP or something. And she called and she said, I'm going to fly to Colorado and I'm going to make it okay. And literally that's sort of what she did. Now, I was, from the outside, I was an athlete. And I had friends and I had this amazing family and I had people who loved and cared about me. But on the inside, I felt this extreme amount of pressure from life. I felt all the time like the world was happening on me. It was happening to me. Like I couldn't get away from it. And it really does seem impossible for most people to believe that though my depression and my sister's death were my greatest heartaches, they have become the greatest source of my inspiration. So there's a poem by William Cowper, it's Pineapple and the Bee, he talks about the external pursuits of human beings for happiness. And it's like this, we're like at a shopping mall, we're like, oh I want this for my happiness, and this for my happiness, and this for my happiness, and then what do you find? That the moment you get it, it no longer has value. So what he says is this, but they who truth and wisdom lead can gather honey from a weed. Now, what he's saying is it's not the thing, but it's how you relate to the thing. Now, my experience of her death could have squandered every single choice I had, but in truth and surprisingly to me, it's become the root of all of my joy. That weed that was her death in my life has become my honey. Now, I am an extremist in the greatest sense of the word. So it's like all or nothing, black or white, this is what I'm going to do or I'm definitely not doing that. Okay? 
okay? And so I had to think of the most extreme thing I could possibly do, which was, I just had to move to India. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody had their own perceptions about what I was doing in India. My, actually, my best friend from seventh grade, she called me, and she's like, okay, you're joining a cult. And so when you get to your cult, and you realize it's a cult, Call me and say cream corn, and I will literally send. I will literally send a rescue mission to you in India and help you. Or like people thought that I was sitting on a mountain, like meditating. It was the greatest time of my life, and I really, truthfully, I thought I was like so glamorous. I was like, oh my god, I'm moving to India. I'm gonna be so great and late by the time I get back, and everybody thinks I'm wonderful. And then I got there. <laughs> Pardon my language. Oh shit, what did I just do? <laughs> now I call it the 10 plagues of my India experience. So I had boils, I had swollen eyes, I had bites, food poisoning a couple times, so that counts as at least like three of my plagues. <laughs> we, had, like, we had no air conditioning, no fan, no nothing. But what kept me there? What kept me were, there was that like truth and wisdom. It's to understand that philosophy that we were studying, so it was three years of philosophy in India, that's it, not yoga. That philosophy at a relative level is human psychology. And at an absolute level, it's transcendental philosophy, which tells you that there's more to the world than just this. You can say that you're not interested in philosophy, but to me what you're saying is that you're not interested in learning about yourself. And our whole life is about becoming prepared for what is. Because what is inevitable is change and slight hardship. So a lot of people said, like, oh, Casey's running, she's running from her sister's death, and this is going to be horrible, and by the time she gets back, everybody's going to have moved on. And I was like, okay, I'm going to still go. <laughs> and what I realized, though, when I got there, is though I seemingly ran from everything, I genuinely arrived at everything in my life, because all I had was me. So we're discussing momentum and the progression of impossible to possible. And to maintain momentum, it's really important to understand these three things. A higher ideal, the power of our choices, and that life is just a mere procession of joy and sorrow. My sister's death in the academy could have, could have done, had done one wonderful and amazing thing, well, a lot of wonderful, amazing things, but I discovered the power of purpose. So loss of purpose is loss of life. And so what you have to find in your purpose is a higher ideal, and a higher ideal is not, I want name, I want fame, I want money, I want a car, I want a great house. It's about finding something beyond your own selfish desires. So if you guys can imagine with me, okay, if you have a magnet and you have iron filings, and what the magnet is is your higher ideal, and when it's turned off, you just have stationary thoughts inside yourself. So through my own experience, I define depression as a concentration of selfish thought. But the moment you find a higher ideal, it magnetizes in what happens to your mind. It literally lifts itself out of you, and you go, ah, I'm inspired. So I started to take responsibility in my own life. I found after I moved back from India, Citizen Yoga. And Citizen Yoga for me was my higher ideal. It hooked my mind and literally sent my body into action, and I had no choice. And everybody was like, what do you mean you're opening a yoga studio? I was like, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> But before India, I was literally afraid of everything. Now, when I say before India, that was like my entire childhood, so. <laughs> and I was afraid of my own shadow. My mom would say that all the time, and I'd be like, oh my god, it's me, okay. I'm going to be all right. And I just felt like the world was going to swallow me up because I wasn't setting my own standard. And I would ask people questions like, what's life about? They'd be like, well, by the time you're 25, you should have kids, and that's going to make you really happy. And I'm like, but maybe that's not what I want. Or college should be the best years of my life, and college was the worst part of my life. And I'm like, now what? So I went out, and I was like seeking all this information, and all the new age information I found was, found was all about getting what you want. It wasn't about anything else. Like, So if you think, then you'll get it. And I had everything I wanted. I had an amazing education. I had a wonderful family. I have wonderful friends, and I still wasn't happy. So Vedic philosophy, which is what we learned, it says inquire and start to understand the world. So see your higher purpose, move towards it, and then choose your action. So karma is choice. 
So we're going to define two terms because karma's going around all the time. You'll have shirts like that people make now, like karma's a bitch or something like that. <laughs> and they have no idea what they're really talking about. But that's fine. And then destiny. And these are all function, karma and destiny function under the law of cause and effect. It's causality. So destiny says that you are a product. That your past actions, literally you have to live with that because the effects are right now in this present moment and you can't do anything about it. But then the beautiful thing is not only does this say you are a product, but you're a producer. So karma says, okay, yes, we have your past actions and you can't do anything, but now you can produce what you want in the future. And so literally karma says, choose, make a good choice. So I was not prepared for my sister's death, and I was even more so not prepared for her suicide. Her decision to take her own life was her inability to see that that seemingly impossible joy would one day become possible with the right momentum. So what would I sit and tell my sister? Like, find a higher ideal? Yes. Make a good choice? Yes. But one of the most important things that I tell myself every single day is that life is just a procession of joy and sorrow. And that the world is going to offer you fluctuation all the time, and that's the one thing it, you will literally and you can literally guarantee. And if we educate ourselves on the inevitability of life, life becomes a little bit easier. So imagine yourselves in this like really beautiful glass house. And you personify sorrow and you personify joy. And we're having a conversation with sorrow in my living room, and it's a really crappy conversation because it's still sorrow. <laughs> and then like up the driveway from my living room, I can see, because it's glass, I can see joy pulling in. And joy is about to walk up my walkway and ring the doorbell. But the interesting thing is this, that my experience is still in sorrow. But what has changed? I know that joy is about to come, and that changes everything for us. So it's a difference about it's a difference of being on the banks of the river or being in the river itself. So the banks of the river, you get to watch life in all of its beauty. But if you're drowning in its fluctuations without purpose and without choice, then what are you going to do? So momentum is a refinement of these three principles. Opposite of momentum is stasis. Without these principles, there's no direct movement, and we literally grasp for our direction. If you've ever read the book, like, Are You My Mother? That's what it's sort of like, like, is this my purpose? Is this my purpose? Is this my purpose? Right? And that's the experience, but the moment you find it, it's north. And they're like, I must go north, and this is where I'm going. And then karma refines our choices, and it literally progresses us through. And then understanding the inevitable fluctuations of life, though, a higher ideal is wonderful, and karma and choosing your life is great. It's not going to offer you just greatness and joy all the time. So knowing the inevitabilities gives you an emotional and intellectual shield. It says, I will be fine no matter what. But it's not enough to listen and read about these truths, as I know. It takes genuine reflection and practice in your daily life. So you don't become the best athlete by theorizing. You have to go into your life and practice these things. So we're all faced with something that really is hard, 100%. But it's through deep understanding of our own power of choice and our ability to remain objective that we lift ourselves onto the banks of our own river. So in a moment of seeming decay, my sister decided to take her own life. And from her choice, I was either going to do the same or I had to take action. The principles that saved my life and could potentially have saved hers, we must talk about. And I talk about them daily in Citizen Yoga. I talk about them here with you right now. And if you look at Detroit, right? Detroit's that thing that you think, like, is it impossible to build it? And it's not. It moves in that exact progression of impossible to possible. So my sister's death inspired all of my momentum. My momentum to move to India, to establish Citizen Yoga, and to most importantly for us, be here now in this present moment talking to you.